So back in the day, 1959, there was a television show that is considered a classic in not just only in television, but in storytelling. It's legendary. In fact, even if you've never watched it, you are familiar with it because we have an expression that comes from the name of this show. It was a show about imagination. It was a show about uh, supernatural and, and weirdness and quirkiness and unusual things uh, all to do with our imagination. And, and invariably, it had some sort of a moral or message in it as well. It was the Twilight Zone. Now, even if you, again, even if you haven't watched it, you've probably heard somebody use the expression, it feels like, actually, I'm feeling it right now, I'm in the Twilight Zone. Um, but it, it has a meaning to that expression, and that meaning is we're in a place where we're not exactly sure what's going on, but something's happening, and it's very unusual and very strange. So, yes, right now. In season two, there was an episode called The Howling Man. Anybody? No? Okay. The story, the story goes some, a little bit something like this, and, and I'll just very briefly, but you should watch it because it's really very fascinating and just brilliantly done. The story is that there's a guy, and he's telling this story in flashback, that he was lost, he was wandering somewhere on a, on a trip, and, and he got lost. Uh, and he was exhausted, it was late at night, and this is somewhere around early 1920s, just sort of about five years after the first war. And he gets lost, but he finds a monastery, and he comes to the monastery, knocks on the door, uh, he, please let me in, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and the monk who answers the door says, no, go away, which is unusual for a monastery, so he, he stays, because he's exhausted, and he bangs on the door again, please let me in, I just need somewhere to sleep. We'll see. I'll check with, I'll check with the, the boss here. And so they let him in the front door, and he has to wait there. And while he's waiting there, he hears this piercing, screaming howl that sounds almost like an animal, but he realizes it's a, it's a person. It's a man. And the monk comes back, and he says, um, well, we don't normally have guests. We don't allow that, but come and talk to, uh, come and talk to the abbot, and he'll, Brother Jerome, he'll explain everything. And he says, what was that noise? Because <laughs> he heard it again. And the brother explains, okay, this is what happened. It's the devil. He was loose in the world. We've, we've caught him, and we've put him in this cell, um, and the door is barred by a stick, which is the rod of truth. And, of course, the guy responds to that exactly how you are right now. No way. But he pretends that he does. He pretends that he believes, believes him and, uh, so, so that he can stay. And then in the middle of the night, he's woken up again by this piercing scream. And he goes and talks to the guy who persuades him to move the stick and let him out. And, of course, the moment he does, it turns out the monks were telling the truth. It's the devil. And he escapes. And of course, as he's going out the door, he transforms into what in the late 1950s we would have considered a very conventional vision of the devil in human form. And then, of course, what happens? The Depression, World War II, the nuclear age, the Korean War. Back to the present. And he turns out he's telling this story to a maid because he spent the rest of his life trying to find the devil again, and he caught him again, and he's imprisoned him in this closet that is barred by a stick that looks suspiciously like the rod of truth that Brother Jerome had. The maid, of course, doesn't believe him and is curious, so she moves the stick, and the episode ends with the door opening. Creepy. Interesting, though. I, I, I find it really fascinating because, first of all, we've sort of anthropomorphized the devil, right? We put him in human form and ascribed all of this stuff that we did um, to the devil, to evil, right? Hate, anger, 
destruction to this character that we've created around evil, the devil. In fact, evil with a D, right? And putting him away makes things better in the world. Locking him away. Isn't it interesting how somebody went there instead of what if love was loose in the world? What if love was loose in the What would the world be like if love was loose in the world? And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, I'm sure the person who wrote that story would not th- describe it this way, but to me, that's like, I think love is our default setting, right? Our factory setting. That's how we come. We are made in love. We are made not only of love, love is within us. We tend to lock it away. What if we didn't? What would the world be like if instead of telling a story where we had to lock evil away, we told a story about how we released so much love in the world, uh, we didn't have to lock evil away? What if instead of locking love away, we let it out? What would, imagine what the world would look like if that were the case. It'd be the opposite, wouldn't it? It'd be the opposite of a, a global war, um, a, a death and destruction, anger, hatred. Wouldn't it be the opposite of that? It'd be way more complicated than that, obviously. But what if we could let so much love loose into the world that it literally created a new earth. You see where I'm going here. Because our two scripture readings this morning are the two key pieces that would make that happen. So first of all, let's get, the, let's get this out of the way. The book of Revelation is not an epic horror story about death and destruction. That was not its intention, ever. The person or persons who wrote the book of Revelation intended it to be a book of hope. It was not meant to make you focus on all of that destruction. Four horsemen, you know, the, the whole thing with the trumpets and the bowls and the, all that stuff, that's not the point. And sure enough, the person writing this story took 21 chapters to get to the point, okay, but it's not the point. It's just getting you there. Why? Because the people he was telling this story to would recognize in all of that that they were living it or had lived it already. So much of that stuff in that story is about living under the Roman Empire. It's metaphors for how, how the world is now. So that you, hearing that story for the first time, would think to yourself, something's about to change. There's going to be something new. A new, Jer- new Jerusalem, a new heaven and a new earth. You'd have hope that the world was about to change. We love to tell the horrific parts of the book of Revelation. I'm not sure whether that's because sometimes I hear people say we like to be scared. I don't believe that for a second because I don't like to be scared. Um, But you might. I don't know. We like horror movies. They sell well. Um, I saw a story recently that there's a big debate now whether or not Doctor Strange is actually a horror movie or not. It's not a superhero. It's but. You have to see the movie. Come on, people. You do. Because so many of these things help us explain where, we, where our thinking goes. And where our thinking goes when we read the book of Revelation is right to all that death and destruction stuff. The end of the world. It's an apocalypse. Do you know what? The word apocalypse doesn't mean that. We made it mean that. The word apocalypse literally means Revelation of revealing. It does not mean death and destruction and the end of all things. 
We made it that. Because we focused on that in this story. And it's not about that. It's about hope. Almost every week, I'm going to say almost every week, because some weeks it's two or three times, another week, two or three weeks not. But somebody asked me if I think we're living in the end times like in Revelation. I believe the answer to that question simply is yes. But there's more to that. Just as if you were hearing the first sto- this story for the first time 2,000 years ago, give or take, you would also think the story is, the answer is yes, but there's more to it. Because all of those, those things about death and destruction and, and plagues and guys on horses and stuff, that, that's, all, that, that's all metaphors for things that, yes, you can certainly see those happening in the world now. But endings and beginnings are happening all the time. Death and destruction and new life and new creativity are happening all the time. It's, a, it's quite literally a cycle. What the person who wrote Revelation envisions is the moment at which we realize that we can make that cycle continue, but turn it into a cycle of continuous good. There is a way. That's why, that's why, well, it might be easy to say, yes, there are always endings and beginnings, and so the book of Revelation really describes things that are continuously going on, absolutely, in, in very small ways. The big picture is the hope, the possibility that we can turn that into a continuous cycle of good, of love, of grace, of community, that death and destruction will be no more. There'll be no more crying, no more pain, because God will be here with us. Except God already is here with us. It's not about whether or not God's coming. It's about whether we realize it or not. And we can realize that vision. We can be part of enacting that vision. Which brings me to a new commandment. The point of Jesus saying to the disciples, and and on the last night that he knows he's going to be with them, by the way, the point of him saying this to them isn't to say, oh, don't worry, warm, warm fuzzies, it's all going to be fine, it's going to be great. His point is to say, you need to do now. I'm going, it's up to you. And what you need to do is, you need to love the way I showed you to love. I'm not talking about warm fuzzies. I'm talking about the real work of loving. Loving your enemy, loving your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. In fact, all of creation is your neighbor. Jesus isn't telling the disciples something Jesus isn't telling the disciples something that isn't in them already. What's new, the new part is, the realization that it is, and that they can make it happen. That's the important part. And by the way, what is the first thing that the the disciples do when Jesus is arrested and killed? They hide. They did not follow his instruction. They went and hid. Not for a second do I think that Jesus thought it was going to instantly happen and it's all going to be perfect and fine. I think Jesus knew it was hard work and it was going to be hard work. In fact, part of the point of the story is, here I am again to remind you (laughs) that all of this love that I talk about is already in you. What you need to do is go and do something with it. And that is hard because we're talking about something very radical that is not your life experience. Your life experience is living under the Romans. Your life experience is being tormented, made fun of, beaten down, oppressed. That is your life experience. It's going to be different now. 
Because in the midst of all of that, you're going to live into the world the love that is in you already. That's the newness. The former things will be passed away. It will be new. That's how these two pieces come together. The author of the book of Revelation didn't have a vision that God was going to do X and we can just sit here and wait for it to happen. But a vision of what could happen if we did the work that Jesus calls us to. The thing, let me say that differently because I'm making it sound like it's all work and no play. The fact is that love is in all of those things. It is in work, it is in play. There are moments when love is easy. There are moments where love is absolutely warm fuzzies and you love it and it's great and everything is all happiness, sweetness and light. And there are moments when it's not. And it's hard because you're having to love somebody who's really hard to love or you're having to love the earth in a way that is difficult and challenging and means perhaps having to give something up in order to give it back to the earth. Nowhere in any of the Gospels or in any of, any of the stories of Jesus that didn't make it into the Gospels, nowhere does it say anything about Jesus saying, this is what happens when you fail. Because Jesus knows that there will always be moments that will not be perfect and it will not go well. Jesus knows there will be moments when we feel like we can't do it. There will be moments when we try very hard to put Jesus up here on a pedestal and remember that we're not Jesus, so we couldn't possibly. Yes, you are, and yes, you can, and that's his point. That's what brings the newness The character in the story seated on the throne says, I am doing a new thing. Not the first time we've heard that. There are echoes of that back in, in Hebrew scripture. But you and I are the hands and feet of Christ. You and I are the ones in whom the love works, through whom the love works in the world. We have much work to do, especially right now. That's why I, I love the fact that the book of Revelation is a story of hope and that we can see it as something that speaks to us right now, that we are perhaps living some of those things because it gives us a perspective both of the small things that we individually can do to make the world new. And it also gives us the perspective of when we all do that together, we can make the bigger picture new too. The, the world new, not just our own little piece of it. We have lots to do. I think we can. I know we can. It's not just a dream, it's a vision. We can make it happen. We can bring the kingdom of heaven here. Even Jesus has the confidence in us. You have to look for it a little bit, but Jesus has the confidence in, in all of creation that we can do that. Why? Think of the number of times that Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is near or here, it is. It's like this close, we're this close. Living love into the world, living the love that Jesus tells us is a new commandment. It's, love's not new. The part that's new is this is how you do it. Go and be me in the world, be Jesus. Jesus. 